personally inspiring. And I said no. Um, I told Jack this story when I met him for the first time earlier this week. Um, and he said that I should start with that anecdote and was so disarmingly nice uh, about the whole thing um, that it's really helped me to have another go at being real and, and vulnerable um, in admitting that I have been and am profoundly moved by someone else's research. So Jack Kazikian was born and raised in um, Baltimore, Maryland, um, and is an assistant professor of geography at the University of Kentucky, um, conducting research at the intersection of critical urban and digital geographies and feminist and queer theory. A key feature of Jack's work is their attention to the co-productions of space and identity in digital and material environments, with an insightful focus on sexual and gender identities, as well as a keen sense of how to sketch, map, and queer epistemic boundaries. Jack's work is of relevance for anyone doing geographical research. It pushes us to think and rethink the categories, tools, and worldviews we work with, challenges the boundaries and boundedness of cartographic, digital, and algorithmic representations, and is always insightful um, and incisive in hearing and making heard those who are too often silenced or deemed invisible in dominant histories, cultures, and spaces. Reading Jack's extensive back catalog of research, um, and particularly their new book, The Queer New York, released last year by New York University Press, will make you a better scholar, educator, and person. In what I suspect um, is probably a fairly characteristic example of Jack's kindness, um, they shared a copy of the book PDF with me when I admitted that it was on my to buy list. Um, and it's been my companion in the evenings, actually, when I settle in uh, after a day of what's been some quite hectic uh, CIGing. So I was struck by Jack's choice of epigraph, uh, quoting Brandy Castle and fellow Baltimore native Adrian Riches diving into the wreck. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths in which our names do not appear. I think that much of what has always drawn me to Rich's poetry is also what is so compelling about Jack's work, which is critical and sharp, but also hopeful and striving. He troubles the hegemonic and its perpetuation in language and thought, attuning to our whole life a translation, the permissible fibs, all those dead letters rendered into the oppressor's tongue, but invites us also to individually and collectively struggle to make the leap toward a better and fairer future, not as a leap, but as a succession of brief, amazing movements, each one making possible the next. So as you can probably tell, um, I am honored um, and very moved to be interesting, to be introducing Jack Seeking today um, and to hear his talk, um, Privacy Could Only Be Had in Public, Feminist Responsibility, Queer Accountability, and Trans Care in Visualising Trans Tumblr. Um, I hope that you'll all find his talk as engaging as I know that I will. So over to you, Jack, um, and thank you. Oh, Maeve, that was a mic drop. Yeah, that, I mean, from Cork to that, I was just hoping, after you told me that story, I hope you were, I told you I was from Baltimore, I thought you were just gonna say Jack is from Baltimore and I would get away with that. That was so beautiful. And so gracious, thank you. I also, I mean, Sig, has, I'm, I'm really honored that um, uh, that Keen and Maeve um, invited me. That Jerry organized uh, an author meets critic for me, and that Karen and Andy and Kath took part. That Karen invited me to be discussing it. It's been amazing to be part of Sig, and um, yeah, I love that everyone's given Maeve the shout outs. Let's, let's just talk about how great Maeve is for this talk. But I wouldn't, I'm into that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Um, I don't think you would like it either. So sorry, but that's your buddy, pot kettle. Um, I, uh, yes, I am, I'm Jack. And um, thank you for making uh, me so welcome. And also, I guess, thank you for making me cry uh, in every session that I come into here at the Conference for Irish Drivers. I'm going to share some slides and get us going. And, and away we go. So I, I changed the title of my talk because I'm like that and I'm sorry. And um, it's there's some quotes in it uh, about privacy could only be had in public. And uh, I, I this is new work for me to ever talk about. I've never done a presentation longer than 15 or 20 minutes on my work on Trans Tumblr. And uh, the subtitle is Queer Responsibility, uh, Feminist Responsibility, Queer Accountability and Trans Care in Visualizing Trans Tumblr. Um, I promise to explain all the words that I'm using about transness. And I also promise to um, uh, uh, talk to you about Tumblr and all these things. 
um, I use he or they pronouns in case you need to know. I also think that it's the end of the conference and you should have an outline of where we're at so you know how close we are to the end. Um, I think it's a nice thing to do. So uh, I'm gonna start with uh, my approach. So uh, in his 1994 book, George Chauncey wrote that privacy can only be had in public. He's, you know, gay men um, in, in New York City at the turn of the other century, the previous century, uh, could only go into uh, pri uh, couldn't go into private spaces together. They'd be arrested, and so cruising winds up becoming a practice that gets normalized and, and expected um, in the world. And it's something that kind of um, you know, as as Kath said uh, uh, yesterday, uh, we've read so many papers about cruising, and that really fueled my work. Um, and something that I started to think about in writing was that the privacy could only be had in private for, for lesbians and queers and trans people, or that's how I started thinking about it, uh, or less queer spaces. Um, but now I'm, I'm thinking, looking at trans Tumblr about how privacy, which is not really ever fully there, could ever be had in public, which was ever not fully there, um, uh, for trans youth trying to, to find one another online. Um, so uh, a lot of the inspiration for this talk is drawn from uh, the work of Hill Malatino, who is a philosopher. And I have some incredibly beautiful quotes. I have to uh, get the, there you, oh, I wanted to, I have to, I have to make this small for one second to make you guys tiny. There it is. Okay, good. Okay, there we can go. Um, so I can see all the quotes. So um, Hill, actually, a lot of the book winds up writing about how, uh, uh, trans people are working towards being in public space and being part of public space. Um, and Hill writes at one point, anonymous, named but not represented, inhaled in the complexity of my need, to be seen and unseen simultaneously, to be comforted and also left alone, to, for once, feel held and witnessed within a public space without being made subject to other people's witness of me. Um, and this is in the book, Trans Care. This is my, this, and this is another way of saying it for Hill, which is on the same page. Sometimes being trans feels like wanting to resist and evade spectacularized visibility with every fiber of your being. Sometimes it feels like just wanting to be seen in all your banality, sleepily chomping on a banana while wearing sweatpants. Right? And I've been thinking a lot about trans publics and privates uh, and I've been thinking about public and private space in my work for a really long time. So I wanted to just kind of like set you up with that. I think if we, when I was originally doing my work on lesbian queer spaces, um, that Maeve mentioned, I you know, was really guided by work by Rachel Payne um, and Susan Smith about uh, women's fear of public space. I was also guided by Petra Doan's Tyranny of Gendered Spaces, thinking about trans people. Um, and this talk is really taking what uh, T.L. Cowan's amazing, awesome, dope communication scholar and friend of mine calls uh, queer trans feminism. Um, and that's uh, uh, that she, she she got inspired from Sarah Ahmed to write about that, so really kind of putting those perspectives together. So feminist responsibility starting this trans Tumblr study. So <clears throat> uh, another quote from Melissa Wright, because why don't we always quote Melissa Wright? It's just the bee's knees. The diverse fields of queer and feminist theories generate political alternatives to the subjugation of people across multiple nodes of difference and myriad hierarchies of power that materialize in relation to them. And uh, this was a, a really exciting for me moment for me in geography because uh, that Progress in Human Geography article was putting queer and feminist thought in conversation. Um, and I remember Melissa being really excited and nervous about it and having me read it. And I had hadn't even graduated grad school when I was reading it. I was like, are you sure you're asking me? Um, and uh, I should, I want to say that this is also uh, that I have a few goals with this talk um, before I jump into, jump into talking about um, all things trans. So one is to really kind of expand the way we think about digital geographies um, through queer trans feminist thinking. Uh, and um, I think that uh, digital geographies is still a pretty nascent field. If you didn't know, there's not a lot about social media in it. It's very bizarre. Um, uh, and uh, we, you know, it's really been kind of fueled from critical GIS. We do a lot of algorithm stuff and uh, prop tech, things like that that Desi Fields work on. I also want to further our thinking about ethics of data visualizations. And I think that geography is probably the best and strongest field uh, to, to, to make um, a lot of those insights because of all of our amazing work on mapping over the years. Um, um, and lastly, I would like to give you a heads up that this is a bit autoethnographic. 
um, and that I'm going to be telling some stories about me in this book. In fact, to go back to this uh, lovely little book, I wanted to say that I actually bought 39 copies of this book and sent it out to all the people who have been essential in my own trans care and my own survival. Um, you know, COVID, uh, trans healthcare is horrible pretty much around the world um, and in some places much worse than others, but trans healthcare and COVID gets all the worse. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States announced um, uh, sometime not far into the pandemic that uh, that if you, um, that health service providers were no longer required to treat LGBTQ people if it didn't um, uh, agree with their religion. Um, so it was an incredibly intense time. And actually that was only repealed a few weeks ago, actually like a week and a half ago. Um, so the kind of things that have been happening in the US um, have been all the harder. So getting us back to what's happening uh, in, in transgenerational shifts, I wanted to set you up with like, what what is this transness? How Why digital spaces, why trans people? So trans people and the internet have always kind of been hanging out together. So in the 80s and 90s, actually, there was a, a thing called Usenet. If you've never seen it, you probably, this might look familiar if you're over the age of 30, late 30s. Um, but the, before there was a web browser, a graphic user interface, we had to you know, use Unix and click and get our email back in the day. Um, I was a big fan of this in college. And uh, I, in fact, Usenet uh, also had the first email associated with it. It was created at Stanford. And the first email was created and sent by a trans woman. And a lot of Usenet was created and coded by uh, trans women at Stanford. Um, and the Usenet arch transgender Usenet archive that uh, Avery Dane Griff has created has been really amazing in actually tracing the creation of a lot of identity terms um, and norms. And this is the creation, uh, tracing the origination of the word um, uh, cisgender, uh, which which is uh, people who identify with the gender assigned them at birth. So if you were given an M or an F on your documents when you were born and you still identify with that M or F, um, then that would mean you're cisgender. Transgender people are people who don't assign with the gender assigned to them at birth. And I promise to get to all the other terms too. So in the 80s and 90s, in terms of trans activism, uh, you might have heard of a really dope woman called Susan Stryker, who is trans herself, and she starts to think, hey, do we have any history? And she's hanging out, of all places, the GLBT Historical Society of San Francisco, where I I'm, I'm in San Francisco today, and uh, starts putting together some amazing insights, including the Compton's Cafeteria uh, uh, Riot, and produces a, an Emmy awarded winning film about that, that uh, Jerry Kearns mentioned yesterday as well. Um, in the 2000s, there was a big shift. Uh, uh, Kath has written about uh, the Michigan Women's Folk Festival, uh, and at one point, uh, this incredibly like lesbian safe space for women born women refused to uh, provide entry for trans women. Um, and they created, uh, many people created cramped trans across the street. Um, at the same time, um, in my research, because which ran from the 80s to the 2000s, I noticed, and my participants noticed, there were a lot more trans people. And maybe you're noticing that too. And maybe you said to yourself, well, gosh, gee, where the hell did all these trans people come from? Well, um, you know, that there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, alt-right or very, um, uh, very uh, right-wing Christian thinking um, that it's it's just kind of like spreading like a, a hip thing to do. Let me just tell you, like, no one's just like, gosh, gee, I want to wake up and be trans. That sounds great. Let me have surgeries on the most sensitive parts of my body. And let me put hormones that like might, you know, put me all over the place. And, you know, I don't feel like that's, no, nobody says that's fun. No, you know, no one's messing with their parents for that reason. It's a, it's a pretty hard thing to, to grasp with, but um, in the early 2000s, um, because the United States does not have nationalized health care, this is a, an incredibly rare instance where this is actually useful. And I'll never say that again, besides this, I'll, I promise, uh, is that uh, LGBTQ health clinics in different cities uh, uh, and Mary Gray told me about this, a group called Lyric in San Francisco. Uh, there were just, because of the internet in the 90s, because of trans history growing and spreading, so many people uh, were coming to San Francisco, trans youth, and they were also, um, uh, uh, um, uh, they were committing suicide. 
because there were no resources for them. And uh, the, these groups uh, worked together uh, to get hormones and bypass the way where you had to wait a year to, to wait to get hormones. Um, and at the same time, so you have a lot of people um, getting access to testosterone for the first time in the 2000s. There was a big surge in access to estrogen as a street drug in, um, in the 80s, I've been told. Uh, and also there was a big increase in the number of trans women in the 80s. And probably that also has to do with the, the early internet. But in the 2000s, we have social media. And so there's a lot of visual representation that we've never been able to have before you know, especially at this level. Um, and then in the 2010s, there's a big surge in trans recognition, whether some of it is positive, there's more uh, slowly increasing trans representation. And we have a lot more trans archiving, the digital trans archive forms. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of positive social media and representations. So also in the 2000s, uh, really important for the, uh, this, you know, is a, international uh, document still for some people recognize in that way, the DSM, the diagnostic manual, the gender identity disorder, which means you're just nuts if you're trans, um, is replaced with a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which means um, it's the anxiety, stress, and depression you feel from being trans uh, in a gender conforming world. Um, also at that time, the trans media representation gets a little bit better. Uh, President Obama speaks out about conversion therapy. He actually uh, makes a move to ban it. Um, that was reversed by Trump and there's efforts by Biden to put back to the Obama status. And I am in Berlin, it's 2011 and it's the middle of the night and I'm looking for my new name because Jen, I've had it for 35 years, it just doesn't feel right and I'm, I'm gonna find it. And there's one other thing that happens is that I decide uh, a few years later that I think it's a great idea to do a project on trans Tumblr. And this is the project I decided to do. I came upon trans Tumblr actually while looking for my new name. Um, and I was shocked that so many youth were sharing uh, so many personal stories, so many images of their surgeries, uh, of uh, talking about um, health knowledge, uh, personal experiences, uh, days at school, experiences with parents, um, crushes that they had. They were really into looking like Justin Bieber at the time, many of them. And so I created this idea of a project to get long-term uh, longitudinal data to look at the cultural and health knowledge production of trans youth on Tumblr. And so the idea of this project was I was going to collect the data every day, get a Python script running and scrape data from the internet. Um, and I'll show you how that works if you're not listening. And produce all these data visualizations to think about uh, the data as a social network um, mapping. What could I do? Could I do uh, visual analysis and so on? X analysis. And I wanted to take all this data to trans youth um, and do participatory action research. And this is where this feminist responsibility, I was really fueled by thinking about Caitlin Cahill's work, PAR work, um, and Michelle Fine, and how I could uh, bring these experiences that were so siloed or whatever you saw on your screen that you thought was the norm, I could give them a bigger glimpse or understanding um, and depth into what was happening on trans Tumblr um, and even train them on this and have them help and then keep reproducing the data visualizations um, and over and over and, and sharing and building that work. This is the email I got from the IRB. Um, very briefly, it says, according to Health and Human Services, which seems to haunt me, by the way, I think, um, I'm not conducting human subjects research because I was grabbing data from the internet. It's completely public, supposedly. And it depends on uh, which university you're at, if that data is public. There's still so many debates about this. The only caveat, and this is important, that last sentence in the first paragraph, is you should not post a message to Tumblr about my research because that would constitute interaction. So I was allowed to gather this incredibly personal, private data that is shared in public um, about trans youth, which shows pictures of their bodies, which would um, one would assume have Latin longitude turned on in most of the photos that you could download that images that information is not blocked as it is on Facebook um, and I couldn't tell them I was doing it it was actually that was the requirement is I could do research and not tell people I was studying them uh, and uh, um, behind the scenes the person in charge of IRB encouraged me at this institution I was at to start the research um, and then take it back to them later and create an, another IRB once I had the data so in 2014, I picked the F to M and M to F hashtags. So what do those stand for? Um, well, back in the day, female to male and male to female were the common ways of referring to trans people. Um, now it's more trans mask, someone who identifies as trans masculine. So we're not focusing on, oh, I was assigned this and now I identify as this. I'm just masculine or trans 
femme or trans feminine, excuse me. Um, so if you know these things about trans people, you might say, my gosh, Jack's really out of date. But actually these hashtags are still used online. Really um, funny thing about F to M is a lot of first time moms think that that's what the hashtag is and it's not and they find out later. That's really funny. Um, so this is what the data looks like. Uh, you get the, the handle of the person, the actual link back to the blog, date and time, hashtags they used, a link to any image or video. Um, and so it's it's very simple. It's just in CV, CSV format. And as of 2001, this has been running every day. I have 15.4 million unique posts that I've been collecting. So technically big data, but because it's in a CSV file, it's it's really not that huge. It's not it's not what um, you know any kind of corporation would consider big data, or um, not what Rob Kitchen would consider big data. Think about it that way. But the the size of it and and the effect of of what it is 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 it's still something I'm personal on. So queer accountability and the absent ethics of data viz. This is all always been my favorite um, definition of, of queer. Uh, it was, I think, uh, you know, I, Kath uh, said yesterday about how she met me at the RGS. And I also remember uh, very, very vividly meeting her. And I think I was, I was especially excited to meet her because uh, to me, this is the first really key piece of queer theory in geography was Kath's anapode piece. And then, and then Natalie, uh, Natalie's work thereafter. Um, and Kath wrote, because queer writings may not remain so queer, queer can remain ever elusively transgressive, not just by defying being named, but by doing what queer does, operating beyond powers and controls that enforce normativity. Um, and in terms of queer accountability, I, there's, uh, I feel that part of my work has to keep thinking about pushing against norms um, that trans youth wouldn't want there, but also talking to trans youth uh, and uh, being mindful of how I store the data, uh, organize the data. Um, when the NSF, the National Science Foundation of the United States made a ruling during Obama while I was collecting data that if uh, you have an NSF, you had to make all the data public. Absolutely, I wouldn't be doing that. So um, I was filled with, it, it, this has been, um, I would say that uh, of the seven years I've been collecting data, I spent five years grappling with massive amounts of data ethics. I thought it was a great idea to start a new project. I didn't realize what I was getting into. Um, for um, the grad students in the audience, I'm gonna show my first data visualization. I wrote a blog post about it called Opaque is Being Polite on my website. And I made this and I thought it was, it was my first effort at text analysis um, in the stats program R. And I was like, my God, it's beautiful. And I went to my colleague, Crystal, who I collaborate still uh, to this day on the text analysis part of this research. And I said, I, I, she's like, what does it mean? I said, I, I don't even know yet. And I spent a lot of time with it and I had accidentally um, created relationships between syllables. I had used a linguistic program. So this means absolutely nothing, but it is just this beautiful queer blob. It's just so gay, right? And the rainbowness of it. And um, I, I wound up uh, finding this image so compelling um, because so many people love it. It gets so excited about it if I show it, but it doesn't mean anything. And I think there's a lot about data visualizations, uh, other forms of them like social networks analyses and text analyses uh, and graphs. Um, that we know from mapping that uh, there's an excitement about the visualization uh, that that holds a lot of power, um, but in fact could convey um, you know absolutely nothing. So this is something I made very early on. Um, a week later, uh, I was going back to the data, and I should say that very early on, uh, when I was looking for my name in the middle of the night in Berlin, I had noticed that every 50 to 100 notes was a suicide note. Um, and I was really scared for these kids. And, uh, you know, as a queer person who grew up in the early nineties, I, I, I don't, I don't know, a, I don't know a queer person under the age of 30 who didn't think about suicide. I just don't, I just never, maybe they haven't told me, but I, I just don't, I think at any point we've had a conversation about it. They've said that. Um, and to think what trans youth are, are facing is um, similar, but different and very painful. Um, but what was amazing, um, and you can take heart in, and I did, is that uh, trans youth would post these notes um, 
uh, that they were considering taking their own life. And hundreds of other trans youth would comment and they would share their phone numbers and they would say, DM me. And they would say, I'm sitting here with you and I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to be with you. And there was this constant way of saving one another and creating this really beautiful community. Um, and that was until about a week after I made that data visualization. Um, and uh, Leela Alcorn, if you've never heard of her, uh, she's incredibly important to the history of, of trans activism. Um, in a very sad way, she uh, took her own life and had her suicide note timed on Tumblr. Tumblr at that time, and uh, even until a few years ago, was the platform for trans youth that kind of accidentally found one another. I'll explain why in a second. Um, but Leela, um, her parents had forced her into conversion therapy and um, uh, she left a note asking President, directed to President Obama, asking him to end conversion therapy, and actually that's why he spoke out about it. Um, uh, and I think about her all the time. And when I mention to people who have any kind of, I would say that everyone under the age of forty-five who's trans that I've talked to about this has been on Trans Tumblr, whether or not they posted or not or liked something, they've seen it, they've looked at it, and it's influenced their life. And I would say. I would talk to people in multiple European countries, Canada and the US and Mexico, and have, have seen this. Um, so I wanted to show you what it actually looks like um, after Leela. Uh, I took a year's worth of data um, and uh, began thinking about um, what uh, trans youth's life looks like on Tumblr. Uh, and uh, I started uh, thinking about ways that I could visualize it. And so um, I'm going to give you a heads up when we think about the ethics of data visualization and the feminist queer transness of them. I uh, prepare to be, um, you know, have many feelings about this, and I expect you're going to have some questions, and I'm psyched for all of them. And I've been thinking about it for five years, so it would be great to really sit down and talk, which is why I decided to talk to you about these digital spaces. So um, the first one kind of really obviously is text analysis and data modeling. You can look at the text in the posts or look at the relationship between hashtag use, all of it over time. Um, and I just, you know, right away, I made some word clouds. Uh, this is a year's worth of data from um, trans mask people. And I just used all the trans mask data. And there's a lot about sense of self, embodiment, um, affect, uh, temporality. And a lot of the temporality is I'm going uh, how many days until surgery, how many days after, how many days until hormones, how many days, months, weeks after, and showing what you look like. Um, trans youth, uh, the uh, people on trans Tumblr tend to kind of stop using it after a year. Um, and probably, you know, uh, with a full dose of something like testosterone or HRT, um, a lot of people start to be recognized. And we don't say passing anymore. We say be recognized um, as their gender. And so there was less posting here and going off into the world. Uh, there's also uh, uh, looking at the hashtags, especially there's a lot of labels of identity. Um, there was, uh, and the thing that stuck out to me most, of course, is this me in the middle. I'll talk about that later. Um, but constantly reasserting identity as the person in this picture is this identity, right? Um, and, and how that worked and who they were, right? And who they were responding to. So the text analysis, that seemed great. That seemed really insightful. That seemed wonderful. The social network analysis, that seemed really exciting too. So, just thinking about it. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I brought up this kind of social network analysis because for those of you who do queer geographies um, or are queer or have been suckered by a queer lesbian friend into watching the L word, you've seen this kind of social network before. And in fact, I had been thinking about networks a lot in my lesbian and queer research. This is the who, this is all the people who have hooked up with one another supposedly on the L word. This is, um, uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, the L word, which is the first and only syndicated international uh, lesbian TV show in the history of the world still today. Um, I, I, I tried to create um, an actual uh, network like this uh, that horribly failed shortly uh, thereafter because people, um, you know, it was like, oh great, I would love to map this out. But then people were like, am I actually gonna tell you who I've hooked up with on the internet? No, not at all. Um, but I took, uh, I loved when this was first introduced on the show, there's two characters, Dane and Alice are talking. 
And Dana says, it's like this whole crazy, tiny little world. And Alice says, crazy, yes, but not tiny. And um, even though that this is coming from this lesbian world, it definitely has, a, which includes a lot of trans people. It's something that like made me think about who was connected to who in ways that I couldn't see. And at least I had these ways of, of liking and reblogs. So what does that mean when you like something? And I promise to explain what this is in a second. It's pretty. So I'm going to let you look at it when I explain what a like and reblog is. So on the photo blogging website that is Tumblr, you can put a picture and then you can put a hashtag if you want other people to find it or some posts to describe it. Um, and people will search for hashtags that they're interested in to find other topics. It's a real big hub for those into anime, um, transness. Uh, just, again, Justin Bieber was quite popular, different uh, crushes on different people. It's really like a teen hotspot, video games and things like that. So if you like something, it's just like hardening anything on any social media and reblogging is sharing it, posting it again. Um, the social network analysis uh, you're looking at here is actually 30,000 likes uh, in a month. So I took a month's worth of data and everyone who liked everyone else. Each of the dots that you see is a person. The bigger the dot, uh, or as a post, excuse me, as a post, and the bigger the dot, the more likes that post got. You'll see on the edge, there are single dots. Those are called singletons. And actually, if you got really close and zoomed in, you'll see there's little pairs, dyads, or little threesomes, triads. And But for the most part, what's profound is that most people are connected in the middle, right? Most people are connected two different conversations and they're related to one another. Uh, the colors are uh, something that the uh, software uh, uh, are, is a statistical uh, package of modularity, which looks for um, like-minded groups having similar conversations. But because when you have 30,000 points of data, it's really difficult to find only eight uh, topics within that. So uh, the colors fade away and we see a lot of gray. Um, is this consistent? Do trans youth consistently talk like this? Yeah, actually, I took a month's worth of data uh, one year apart um, and compared the users. Uh, there was uh, there usually is anywhere from twelve to eighteen thousand likes for uh, five years of my data until the not safe for work bill passed on the internet and all social media removed every single. Um, uh, nipple or anything that was considered sexual. Of course, if you're a trans person and getting um, uh, any kind of surgery, you would have shared a picture of your top. And so all those, uh, all that really great medical information uh, was disappeared. Um, and trans people, excuse me, started drastically using the website less. But what's really cool and is that I'm sure you've heard about six degrees of separation, um, but we have 4.8 and 5.6 degrees of separation. This is dope because this means that it's closer than the world's average, which is six. It means actually like a closer bond and tightness. So there's, there's, there's great information. I'm feeling really positive. Um, and I was feeling really great until I, I took this image to, to the social media collective at Microsoft, which I visited from time to time. And my, my buddy and my mentor, Mary Gray, I showed this and I had all the names up. And she said, and I'll, I'll just show you what uh, this is. And the bigger the dot, again, is the more likes. And um, the week before, I was uh, then teaching at a, a small college in Maine. And I, I showed my students, like the trans students, that I had made this. And they knew who all of these accounts were. And uh, they knew the posts. And they said, oh, this guy is awful. He's so mean. He's always, he's always, he's awful. And um, they were able to identify each of these people and they knew them by heart. And they said, oh, this is like, wow, it's like a visualization of what my world is, right? And it really hit them. So each of these dots you see as a person, and again, the lines are the links between them. Um, but when I showed it to Mary Gray, she said, you know, how dare you put their names up there? And I said, oh, but it's public. And she said, is it? And that's where my idea of what, again, was public or private really fell apart. You know, um, many of these uh, youth are now adults and they may be stealth. They may be living a life in which they're recognized um, as the gender that they know that they are. And they don't want to think about what they did in high school. And they think that no one's looking at their Tumblr data or someone was collecting it uh, seven years ago, but I was. Right. And of course, that's something I need to think about and care about. And so all these names have been removed. Right. So how do I then represent the data to you eventually to show these relationships, to talk about who influenced things and why over time? And how do I share that data? So, you know, I had the text analysis, the social network analysis, and that's when I was approached. And I really found it the creepiest thing. And I was I was trying to think it was 
okay? Because Mary Gray actually introduced me to a visual recognition software person. And she said, you know, there's a male and female package that runs in the background of all software. So Facebook, um, it's just running across the internet at any time. Now that Instagram's owned by Facebook, um, it's always uh, doing that. And she's like, it would be great to, you know, look at the images and see if people are, I was really interested if they were indoors or outdoors. Did they feel comfortable taking photos outside? There seemed to be a, a trend where people took photos inside um, before they had surgery or hormones and a photo is outside and it very metaphorical and really interested in the private and the public of that. Um, but she told me that uh, actually this male female package, um, it would be great to show how much it left trans people out. And I didn't really feel comfortable with that. And the more research I did, I actually found out that um, the very early packages to see if someone was male or female on the internet took um, photos of trans people uh, without their permission and then used them, marked them as male or female based on the way the coder saw them. Talk about algorithmic injustice and a shout out to Catherine McKittrick's Dear Science book at this point um, uh, uh, about racial injustice and, and Sophia Noble's work too, um, and decided whether or not they were male or female and then measured maleness and femaleness against them. Um, just recently, uh, all of the trans drivers, I think it, they said like all of them were locked out of Uber when they went to log in one day when they had facial recognition software because it didn't recognize them as male or fail, male or female, and then lock them out. Um, so uh, facial recognition software, which is coming to a town everywhere near us and then voted down or used without our um, uh, knowledge, uh, is, is heavily against trans people. And uh, I actually still have people who reach out to me about wanting to work on visual recognition um, and how deeply uncomfortable and unsafe I feel about using this data for that way and how also this data is public and anyone else could grab it and use it and how uh, this needs to be intervened in. I also included a picture of Zach Blass's brilliant facial weaponization suite where he took um, the faces of hundreds of gay men and morphed them together to make a face that's completely, he calls it um, uh, the fag face mask, that's completely unrecognizable to any facial recognition. So you can wear that mask and you can actually see out of it um, and facial recognition can't see you. And he's always working on these sorts of masks as well. So the last sort of kind of uh, 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 data visualization, I know we're saving the best for last. It's obviously mapping. Um, so uh, also when I was at Microsoft, everyone kept asking me about mapping. And of course, because I'm the geographer who goes to data visualization conferences, or I'm the geographer at American Studies Digital Humanities uh, Caucus, or you know, I'm always that, I'm always the geographer. People are like, obviously you're gonna make a map. Um, the thing is that these pictures you're seeing that I, I blurred out, most of them I would say that you see on Trans Tumblr are, are in bathrooms. Um, and you would think that their parents don't know that they're taking it and they look quite young. I don't know how young they are, um, but they can't give permission for me to use this. And most it's uh, something around like over 85% of youth uh, using an iPhone leave their geolocation on because they want to see where they were later on. They like the map. Um, uh, and I spent a long time. How have I mapped it yet? I'm just going to say, no, I haven't mapped it yet. I'm just, that's just, I, it just, it gave me New York. It knows I love New York. Um, uh, when I took a Google Maps picture for y'all, I haven't mapped it. Um, but I have to tell you, I've decided to map it. So I'm in the process of downloading that data and then masking it. And the questions I'm going to ask are really oriented towards spatial statistics. Um, how far is it to an LGBT center? Uh, how far is it to a transgender affirming doctor? Um, are you in an urban location? Uh, are you um, near a major transport hub? Um, how do class dynamics and using census data to really critically think about patterns uh, that we see, but not at all revealing and only reporting statistics and not ever showing a map? of where trans people are in any way, shape or form. I might accrue it to the number in a state or a region, um, but uh, you know, having lived in Kentucky now uh, and just thinking you know, if one person in Harlan, Kentucky uh, in 2017 is putting something on trans Tumblr and someone sees that uh, and Harlan is you know, a pretty red uh, kind of area, very re a US Republican, um, uh, sees that they might, you know, be like, oh, that's that kid and go look for that data. So it's really about protecting people and, and their identities. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me in, in the struggle, because it was a struggle. Um, it's still a struggle. And um, 
uh, I think throughout that process of uh, figuring out what I was mapping and where I was, uh, what I was mapping, I also, so much happened in the world when I said gender identity uh, disorder became gender dysphoria. I actually walked into uh, my class that I was teaching in 2013. It's my first teaching job. And I said, something amazing just happened. And they said, what? I said, I can no longer be institutionalized and put on a Thorazine drip because I'm wearing the clothes of the opposite gender. And the students looked at me and shocked. And I think it's important for people to hear people in power talk about this. Because when we think about trans people, we often think about youth. And we often think about disempowered. I think uh, the statistic is something like it's at 60% of, of uh, trans people um, uh, don't finish college. 40% of them experience homelessness at some point. I am, I am, my trans life has tiptoed through the tulips in comparison. Um, I am white and middle class. I went to, I didn't know what I was doing, but I went to an, an elite college. Um, I got a good job and I, I didn't know what I was doing for grad school, but I asked Suddenly happened to go to a wonderful place. Um, and I have been supported and loved by many people. Um, and it's it's very uh, you know, a, a rare thing. Anyway, we should move on from the slides so I can put a better image in the background when I'm telling these things. This is one of my favorite quotes ever about trans theory from Cameron Awkward Rich, who's actually a, a real brilliant poet and essayist. Transness at minimum is the insistence on the human capacity for once unimaginable change. Um, and I think for something uh, that I've thought about a lot um, is how mind blowing this work continues to be. And I think that it also took five years to wrap my heads around, head around the data visualizations um, because I also had to figure out my place in it. And it was incredible. It was just impossible for me to sit down and read trans health literature. It was, it was um, grueling and agonizing and sad. And I just thought I cannot write about suicide and I, I cannot do this and I will find, I'll just, I'll wait till I can. And I kept waiting and I realized I can't, there are other ways to do this, uh, uh, to do this work um, to, that I don't need to other people. I have other people who wanna work with me in public health who wanna write about suicide. And um, I can write about uh, some matters of health and I can grow in that way. From where I am, but that that took a lot of care and effort, and it took a lot of love and acceptance. Um, you know, uh, it will be announced soon by the University of Kentucky officially that I have tenure. Um, and at that moment, um, to the best of mine and Ray Rosenberg's knowledge, I will be the only trans person tenured in a geography department in the world. I have uh, I've reached out to people in Brazil and uh, Philippines and in every country. I think I figured this out a few years ago because before Ray was hired at Edinburgh, um, I was like, I can't be the only one. Um, a feminist geographer I, I love so very much said to me, well, there's like five of you now, right? And I was like, oh God. And then I realized, you know, Petra Doan is in a planning department. Kyan Gao is also in a, uh, Go is in a planning department. And I, I realized, wow, um, when did this happen and, and how? Um, so, uh, it's, I think it's important for me to also talk about my stories um, because there are so many trans students coming into geography um, and a lot of people don't know these things and they don't know what to read or how to uh, support trans students. There are no, there's absolutely no trans mentoring for any kind of dean for trans faculty. Um, and those numbers, you know, very slowly increase. It seems everybody wants a tra one trans faculty member at, at least. Um, so what are the things that keep me going? So this is my favorite thing, uh, is the me um, in this document. In fact, at this point, I have looked at all, it's it's almost exactly eight years of data really soon. Um, and uh, it, me ranks as one of the top five terms that M to M and M to F use uh, for, that, you know, for like eight years. Like that's incredible. And um, I look at this data and I think how, vulnerable and generous and hopeful uh, these trans youth were. And that's um, very much guided me um, in my work. So this is what uh, uh, my, my dear friend, Crystal Hall, who's this dope cis straight white lady of the Bowdoin, uh, where I did my postdoc, um, have been working on different kinds of social network analyses. So what you're seeing um, was kind of 
uh, I've done, we've done a bunch of these. I just included one just to kind of close this out to, to kind of see where that, how the health uh, analysis is going. So on the left, all the little dots are um, talking about the word uh, binder. So that's like something you use to compress uh, um, breasts. I don't know if everyone used the term breast, but compress your chest and have a very flat chest. Could be like an ace bandage, could be like a professional bought object. The green down the bottom is binding. So what's interesting is nobody really wants to talk about binding. It's kind of like obvious how you do it. Some people want to share, but most people are talking about binders um, and they're looking for binders and what to buy. On the right-hand side, they're talking about top surgery, which is a uh, for people identified as trans mask, a double mastectomy followed by a pretty intense plastic surgery to uh, construct uh, uh, pecs. And what's amazing is in the middle, there's some overlap that you see, but for the most part, um, people are talking to one another about these topics. Um, someone would use a binder um, before top surgery and someone might never get top surgery or someone might not use a binder and just go on to having top surgery. Um, but there is for, for many of the people who uh, I read their stories in Trans Tumblr and who I've followed like some accounts that I've dived very deep into, there is a trend for a lot of people to use a binder and then to have top surgery. Um, and I thought, okay, this is great. I'm gonna ground this uh, in different studies. And there's a lot of very like public health kind of literature on this, but I turned to Trans Studies Quarterly, which has been around exactly as long as uh, my research uh, has been going on with Trans Tumblr, and I, you know I had ten thousand uh, different um, hashtags that used different kinds of surgery. Um, but uh, when I went through, I had at this point I only downloaded six years of data. I've downloaded the other eight years. Um, while thirty percent of the articles mentioned surgery in Trans Studies Quarterly, which is the premier and only Trans Studies journal, only three percent mentioned top surgery, or four percent mentioned bottom surgery, and only the words binder or binder, binding are mentioned three times in the entire journal ever. It has uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles in it right now. Well, 401 articles, I think it's around 600. Yeah, the, article, the journal gets longer. Um, and so this kind of temporality of thinking about uh, uh, you know, what kind of trans publics are accounted for in trans studies quarterly are really those kind of moments after the surgery, right? The tap surgery has happened and this kind of this moment of transness about binding or packing um, or you know filling a bra, all those moments are are lost. And I think that this is a contribution too from this data and uh, to shift trans studies uh, ways of thinking. And hopefully these data visualizations can push that as well. And I and I love those coming out of geography. So what comes next? Tra la la. This is probably the most famous quote right now in trans studies. So I want to share it with you last. Celia Riley Snorton is just the bee's knees um, and wrote a book called Black on Both Sides in which this comes from. We must understand the ongoing struggle in the present by way of a future aspiration in which black lives will have mattered to everyone. For some, that future effectively means the end of the world. Even so, and as yet, there is still life. Um, and that's how uh, Riley ends the book. Um, and the idea of will have mattering is something that so many people are writing about right now. Um, in terms of who matters and not these, I wanted to show you the 82 bills in 37 states uh, that are anti-transgender bills. Many of them have uh, not made it to the floor, have been postponed, uh, but they created a lot of havoc. Um, I did some research into Ireland. I spent a lot of time reading about it and uh, maybe it's just the news that I found, but wow, um, 2015, uh, there was the gender recognition documents and mostly things were, you know, painted as quite positive and, and, and lovely and nice. But um, uh, this is, to think about this is, you know, um, way over half of the United States um, and 20 of these bills alone are in the state of Texas. Um, so that, that's also worth noting. Um, so there's a lot going on and there's a lot of reasons to do this work uh, and to keep thinking about it. Um, so there is this sense of privacy in public for trans youth. And I think that's what's guiding me is to think about, um, what is private space and what is public space for so long? We, do you remember when we wrote about public space all the time? We wrote about it all the time. And I think, you know, I was really, um, I edited this reader called the People, Place, and Space Reader, and we did a section on public and private. And, uh, uh, you know, I was working with like Cindy Katz and Seth Lowe and Susan Sager and my buddy William Manville, and we had these like queens of, you know, the study of space and place. 
And we, this is all five of us couldn't come up with an article on private space. Um, and really even still today, uh, I think because of 9-11 and, and I think uh, because of the shift in uh, like, you know, national, international security states, um, there's been so much work on privacy, but you know, what is private uh, still needs examination. Um, thinking about how someone's data is not, uh, is being used about you um, and how that should be used and working towards ethic guidelines uh, for data visualizations, for data collection. Um, uh, that uh, a lot of what I found too is that in this space, because they're teenagers, they're like telling each other they're not trans enough. Um, and there's a lot of fights about that. Uh, and there's a lack of knowledge in any kind of uh, LGBTQ generational group. There's a lack of knowledge of what came before. Um, but with this group, they're reproducing it on a daily basis. Um, and how can there be interventions to get them this information uh, so there's less hurt and a, a lack of awareness. And um, there are small measures in which knowledge accrues and I'm interested to, to see that. So there's the, the trans enough, They're actually these words too cute and true scum. And I feel like I'm an old trans, you know, um, also when I told someone I was doing this work, someone said, oh, you should meet my friend. They're a trans parent and a parent of a trans kid. And I thought, I don't, I don't, I don't have kids. What would I, I don't know. Why would I talk? I don't know what it's like to be a five-year-old trans kid. And I also was introduced to hang out with an eight-year-old trans kid, which, you know, and I did, and we hung out and they said, did you always know? And I said, yeah. And they said, okay. And that's the only thing they wanted to ask me. Right. So there, there's a, um, you know, what I'm experiencing is definitely not uh, what trans youth are experiencing. The studies I've seen um, in multiple countries, uh, uh, especially like um, in, in urban centers, uh, Canada and the US is something like um, most people, like youth under the age of 18 have known uh, cl closely in their life, at least one trans person. I think it's like up to like almost 70% is the number. Um, and what's going to happen when these people get older and have more powers, you know, obviously these, these conversations will shift. Um, very much and these policies will change. But in the meantime, it's, it's uh, quite difficult about how we do that um, and why. So I'm thinking about how privacy could be had in public and rethinking about what those spaces are. So thank you very much. And sorry, I went over. And um, since many people ask, there are, it should pop up eventually. Um, there it goes, there it is. These are all the, gosh darn it. There's all the platforms that I use. I will just stop sharing. Oh, there you can see it so much better. Uh, and you can see it.